Welcome to today's special edition of Go Beyond with Pastor Michael Eurisha. Michael is an international speaker, songwriter, and the senior pastor of the Judah Ministries International Worship Center, located in McKeesport, Pennsylvania. If you are ever in the greater Pittsburgh area, be sure to come and visit us. For more information about our ministry, please feel free to visit our website at www.judahministries.net. Here's Pastor Michael. Greetings in the matchless name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Hi, I'm Michael Eurisha, the senior pastor at the Judah Ministries International Worship Center, and I'm so glad you're able to join us for today's midweek Bible study. So uh, first off, let me welcome all our first time Facebook viewers as we are now broadcasting our midweek Bible study as well as our Sunday morning services on our Facebook page. So for all our Facebook fans and friends, uh, we welcome you here to tonight's Bible study. So we want to ask you to, if you would help us to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you can do that by simply clicking on the share button on your Facebook page. And this is a great way to evangelize the world and your family and friends, people that you're associated with. You could just simply hit that share button or tag them and they could tune in to the Bible study uh, and or the Sunday morning service as well. Now, today we are continuing our study of Eschatology 101. Today is part five. This is, our, this is our fifth lesson. It's part five. And our focus today is on the time of Jacob's trouble. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. So we're going to primarily look at two uh, passages of Scripture. We're, we're going to study out of Romans chapter 10 and then into uh, chapter 11 a little bit. So open your Bibles to uh, Romans chapter 10 and also Jeremiah chapter 30. Jeremiah chapter 30. You could bookmark that. So those are going to be our primary uh, sections of scripture that we are going to take a look at today. Now, before we go on, I just want to give a shout out to everyone that who has requested the uh, study outline that you're following along with us here. Uh, with the Bible study, we send them out every Wednesday so that you have it in time for today's lesson. We email it to you. So we're so excited of all of you who have uh, requested them. Uh, it's just encouraging to me that there is a, a desire for the study of eschatology and uh, the end times. Uh, fortunately <laughs> and unfortunately, I've heard from folks all over who have been in church all their lives and never have heard teaching on prophecy, the end times, or any type of esca, uh, any type of study on eschatology. It's astounding to me, and, and I, I guess because uh, when I was brought up, I just had such a curiosity about the prophetic word of God. So it's amazing to me. So, in any event, we are glad. We are glad you are here with us. Now, the most amazing benefit that comes from the study of the prophetic word of God is its accuracy. It's what separates our Bible apart from every other piece of literature on the face of the earth. You have prophecies that were written 2,500, 2,700, 3,000, 4,000 years ago that have either A, have already come to pass in absolute accuracy or are coming and will come to pass in the future. So the prophetic word, the prophetic teaching validates the word of God, which builds our faith. We can certainly put our whole faith and trust into the word of God because of its prophetic accuracy. So if you would like to receive a study outline or if you ask a question, if you have a question concerning uh, the study of eschatology or, uh, you know, if you would just like to simply send us a comment, uh, you could send that to uh, go beyond at judaministries.net. That's go beyond 
at judahministries.net. So we'd listen, we'd love to hear you hear from you. It's very, very encouraging. And uh, here's an email from Joanne from Wilmington, Massachusetts. From Wilmington, Massachusetts. Joanne sent us an email that said, What a difference you have made in providing study notes for my first Bible study that I could actually understand and process. My whole life, I have sat in a church and read along with the gospel. I finally was recommended to visit your Sunday service online via YouTube, and you have changed my life. I have opened a Bible, and now I am enjoying it greatly. Thank you again for bringing me closer to Jesus Christ and providing me with the visual tools I need to hear his word. You have truly made a difference in my life. Wow. Listen, thank you, Joanne, for your email. And listen, that's really what this Bible study and what the ministry is all about, sharing the word of Jesus Christ so that we all might grow in faith. And I tell you, it's a great honor. It's a great honor for me to be able to serve the bread of life to the family of God. Amen? Amen. Well, before we get into the Bible study today, let's open up with a word of prayer. Our Father, in the matchless, holy, powerful name of Jesus Christ, we come before you today. Father, we thank you for Joanne and ask you just to continually bless her and open her mind, open her spirit, open her heart that she might receive your word. And Father, we ask that you would open all our hearts, minds, and spirits this day, Father God, because you are the great teacher, Holy Spirit. Teach us your word that we might be transformed even into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So today we're going to take a look at the time of Jacob's trouble. The time of Jacob's trouble. But before we do that, let's just do a quick review, as always, of our terminology that we have learned in the first four weeks. The first word is eschatology. Eschatology simply means the study of of the end times or the study of the last days eschatology that's why the uh the theme of this study is eschatology 101 we're covering all the basics of end time studies from old testament to new testament from genesis all the way through the book of revelation the second term uh that we um learned was tribulation or the tribulation period. This term simply means the last seven years on earth as we know it. The last seven years on earth as we know it. And I believe we are coming very, very close to that time. You could read about the the tribulation period in your book of Revelation, starting with chapter 6 all the way through chapter 19 when Jesus Christ returns with us, his church and eventually defeats the devil. So the tribulation period is the last seven years on earth as we know it. <clears throat> Armageddon is a valley in Israel that, where the final battle will be fought between God and the kings of this earth. It's also known as the Battle of Armageddon. You can read about that in the book of Revelation chapter 16 the millennial reign or the millennial reign of Christ. This is a period of 1,000 years, hence the word millennial. 1,000 years after the tribulation period when Jesus Christ returns and establishes his kingdom on earth. After he established, he's going to establish his kingdom on earth. So very quickly, we have the Old Testament time, the time of Israel, when Jesus Christ comes on the scene. We have what is we now call the New Testament. Uh, at the uh, book of Acts, chapter 2, we have the birth of the church. Until now, we have what is known as the church age. For the last 2,000 years, we are in the church age. At the very end of that, we're going to have the seven-year tribulation period. It's a transitional time into the final thousand years, which will be the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. You could read about the millennial reign of Jesus Christ starting in Revelation chapter 20. The other uh, term, another term is rapture. 
Uh, the rapture in our study context is defined as the miraculous, mysterious disappearing of the true church of Jesus Christ from the earth. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, you can read about the rapture of the church. The Bible says that in the twinkling of an eye, we are going to be changed from this body to a glorified body and we will meet Jesus Christ in the air and we will be in the presence of the Lord from that time on forevermore. So it's the miraculous, mysterious disappearing of the church of Jesus Christ. Now, we spent two whole lessons speaking about the rapture. So if you'd like to catch up on that, you could visit our YouTube channel and uh, you could you know, go through both studies uh, on the raptures. It was in lessons three and lessons four. And I'm sorry, lessons two and lessons three. Last week, we studied the abomination that causes desolation, which was in lesson four. The abomination that causes desolation is another term we uh, learned that that is when the Antichrist stands in the temple. He stands in the holy place and he proclaims himself to be God. He proclaims himself to be God. Now we studied that in detail last week out of uh, Daniel chapter 9, uh, Matthew chapter 24, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and uh, Revelation chapter 13. Those were our four scripture references that point toward the abomination that causes desolation. Now this week we are studying what is known as the time of Jacob's trouble, the time of Jacob's trouble. This refers to the tribulation period, the last seven years on earth as we know it, with its focus on the Jewish nation, hence the name, the time of Jacob's trouble. So let's open our Bibles up to our first scripture. It's gonna be in Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, we will begin reading at verse 16. So it's Roman chapter 10. We'll begin reading at verse 16. Now remember, it's the time of Jacob's trouble. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. <clears throat> you have Abraham, you have Isaac, <clears throat> you have Jacob, the three patriarchs of the Jewish nation, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Then Jacob wrestled with God in Genesis chapter 32. And when we read that, the Bible says that God changed Jacob's name to Israel. So once was Jacob, so he is now Israel. So this is the time of Jacob's trouble, or this is the time of Israel's trouble. It is not the time of the church's trouble. That's very important that we understand what the tribulation period uh, is about. And I also believe <clears throat> that this supports the pre-tribulation rapture. Remember, the tribulation of the book of Revelation is all about the salvation of the Jewish nation. Let me say that again. The tribulation in the book of Revelation is all about the salvation of the Jewish nation nation. The church of Jesus Christ is nowhere found in the book of Revelation after chapter 4. The church is raptured at the beginning of chapter 4. There's worship going on, but then from there all the way to the church returning with Jesus Christ in Revelation chapter 19, you don't read about the church at any point throughout the book of Revelation. Also, in Revelation chapter 7, we see that God appoints, he selects 144,000 Americans to evangelize. No. <laughs> he appoints 144,000 Gentiles. No. He appoints 144,000 Jews as evangelists to evangelize the entire globe. The Bible's clear to say that he takes 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes. And that's how you get the number 144,000. You can read about this in your Bible, Revelation chapter 7. So why does God select 144,000 Jews specifically? Why? Well, who better to witness to a Jew in the time of Jacob's trouble than a Jew? Israel has not listened 
to the Gentiles for the past 2,000 years. So, you know, what makes you think they're going to listen to Gentiles during the time of Jacob's trouble when Israel is really under assault? Because that's what the book of Revelation is all about. It's all about Jerusalem and Israel and the Temple Mount. So God appoints 144,000 Jews to evangelize the world. Uh, now, during this time, during this hell on earth, during the tribulation period, I believe there will be a great outpouring. There will be a great revival, a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit. However, once again, it will be led by 144,000 Jews. So let's take a look at what the Apostle Paul uh, wrote about this in his letter to the uh, letter to the Romans, beginning in chapter 10, starting with verse 16. Here's what Paul wrote. But not all, uh, let me start that again. But not all the Israelites accepted the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. But I ask, did they not hear? Of course they did. Their voice has gone out into the earth, their words to the end of the world. Verse 19, again I ask, did Israel not understand? <clears throat> First, Moses says, I will make you envious. In other words, he's going to provoke their jealousy by those who are not a nation. I will make you angry by a nation that has no understanding. Here, Paul is writing about the Gentiles, uh, about the Christian nation, you know, after the book of Acts, we are provoking the nation of Israel. Because why? He says in, in his word, he says that uh, we had no understanding because in the Old Testament, the Gentiles weren't privied to the things of God. So the whole thing is shifted now. So Paul is writing, and he continues on in verse 20. He says, and Isaiah boldly says, I was found by those who did not seek me. How many amens can I get there? Hmm? I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. But concerning Israel, he says, all day long I have held out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. Continuing in chapter 11, verse 1, Paul says, I ask then, did God reject his people? By no means. I am an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. God did not reject his people whom he foreknew. Don't you know what scripture says in the passage about Elijah? How he appealed to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars. I'm the only one left, and they're trying to kill me. And what was God's answer to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. And if by grace, then it cannot be based on works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace, thank God. Verse 7, what then? What the people of Israel sought so earnestly, they did not obtain. The elect among them did, but the others were hardened. As it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that could not see, and ears that could not hear to this very day. So Paul is writing about the condition of the Jewish people during the church age, which began once again at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. That was the birth of the church age, which we are still living in now 2,000 years later. So he's stating that at the present time, during the church age, even till today, the nation of Israel is blinded from the gospel of Jesus Christ. Even Jesus himself stated that in the, in the gospel of Luke, uh, in chapter 19, verses 41 through 44, Jesus says, as he approached Jerusalem, Jerusalem and he saw the city, he wept over it and said, if you, 
even you had only known on this day what would bring you peace. But now, here it is, it is hidden from your eyes. So because of the hardness of their hearts, the gospel of Jesus Christ is hidden from the eyes of the Jewish nation. However, when the church is removed, when the rapture happens, in the twinkling of an eye, a new dispensation will begin and the eyes of the Jewish nation will be opened up. It will be opened up with the help of the 144,000 evangelists that will be roaming the earth, preaching the salvation through Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus our Messiah. Let's pick it up in Romans chapter 11. Let's jump down to verse 25. Here's what Paul writes. He says, I do not want you to be ignorant my, uh, of this mystery, brothers and sisters. Remember, he's writing to this, this letter to the Gentiles. He's writing this to the Romans, born-again believers. He doesn't want us to be ignorant of this mystery so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Mount Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. So, my brothers and sisters, God has a covenant with the nation of Israel. And God is not a covenant breaker. He will keep his word. He will keep his covenant with the nation of Israel. And at the proper time, the nation of Israel will be saved. So, right now, we are still living in Revelations, uh, Revelation chapters 2 through chapters 3. We're still in the church age, right? Uh, but there's going to be a time the that we just read, Paul said, when all the Gentiles come in, when that last Gentile is saved, we will move into a new dispensation known as the time of Jacob's trouble. This is the account in the scripture reference as the time of Jacob's trouble. So let's turn our Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 30. Jeremiah chapter 30. We're going to, to begin reading at verse 1, and we're going to read through verse 8. So Jeremiah chapter 30, beginning in verse 1, the Bible states, This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Write a book, all the words I have spoken to you. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will bring my people, Israel and Judah, back from captivity and restore them to the land I gave their ancestors to possess, says the Lord. So let's take a pause there and let's put Jeremiah's writing in uh, to context real quick. <clears throat> Jeremiah is writing this prior to Israel's captivity by the Babylonians. Right, so he, this is written before they were even captive by the Babylonians, which happened in the late 500s BC. Late five, remember they destroyed the city of Jerusalem and Israel, the temple, in 586 BC. So this writing precedes all that. Now, as we know, the Jews, and history bears this out, we know it from the scripture as well, we know the Jews were in exile in Babylon for 70 years, uh, uh, as also prophesied by Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 29. He said that they would be there for 70 years, and they surely were, and then they returned back to the land of Israel to rebuild the second temple <clears throat> beginning in 516 BC. So Jeremiah's prophecy that we're reading preceded all of that. Let's continue to read verse 4. <clears throat> the Bible says, These are the words the Lord spoke concerning Israel and Judah. This is what the Lord says. Cries of fear are heard. Terror, not peace. Ask and see, can a man bear children? 
then why do I see every strong man with his hands on his stomach like a woman in labor? In other words, labor pains. Doesn't that sound like a familiar phrase? Every face <clears throat> turned deathly pale. Verse 7, how awful that day will be. No other will be like it. It will be a time, here it is, of trouble for Jacob, a time of trouble for Israel, but he will be saved out of it. So just like we read in the Paul's letter to the Romans, God will save Israel out of their time of trouble. Verse 8 says, in that day, that's a key phrase, in that day, declares the Lord God Almighty, I will break the yoke off their necks and will tear off their bonds. No longer will foreigners enslave them. Instead, they will serve the Lord their God and David their king, who, uh, whom I will raise up for them. So there's a couple of items here. Let's walk through this passage a little bit. Uh, number one, the phrase, that day in the Hebrew language. When you, know, when you read these in prophetic passages, as uh, uh, Jeremiah just wrote in verse 8, in that day, uh, how awful that day will be. When you see that type of a phrase, uh, that's a Jewish phrase, or in, in the Hebrew language, it frequently is used in prophetic scriptures to introduce information all right, concerning the day of the Lord. Not necessarily a day per se, but a season or a time or a dispensation, the day of the Lord, a significant eschatological theme. In other words, for the end time events. So it's speaking, once again, about the day of the Lord, not a date per se. Number two, unfortunately, this is what it's going to take to get Israel's attention, the time of Jacob's trouble, a time of an all-out assault against the nation of Israel. <clears throat> when we read through Revelation 6 through 19, we see the atrocities and the devastation to the earth and the people in it. However, it will be focused on the land of Israel, even in the abomination that causes desolation. You know, they go into the temple where the Antichrist is going to set himself up to say, I am God. So the focus is always on Israel, Jerusalem, and most importantly, the Temple Mount. Now, <clears throat> I know I've stated this many times, but the book of Revelation is all about the God's grace, his mercy, and his love. And I know it's very difficult for us as uh, finite human beings with our minds to comprehend God's love as it seems like he's just completely destroying the earth. Uh, but w as we read through there, as we read through the book of Revelation, <clears throat> it continuously says, says that there'll be hell and earthquakes, but they didn't repent. There'll be war and a billion people will be killed, but they didn't repent. There will be disease and famine and the water just ruined, but they did not repent. Remember, brothers and sisters, the word of God says, God says that it's his will that all should come to repentance. It's his will that all would be saved. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son, one and only son, begotten son, Jesus Christ, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but be saved. So the entire book about Revelation is not about the destruction of the earth. It's about God's love being poured out, say, repent and come to me and you will be saved. Now, once again, I know we have a hard time seeing God's love, but listen, when we were children and our you know, mother or our father took a belt upside our backside, we didn't really think that was love at the time either. But how many of you know that a, a true loving parent will do anything to get their child on the right track? And God is a loving father. Whatever length he has to go to, to draw people to him because of his love, he will do it even including destroying the earth as he does in the book of Revelation. Now, in verse 9, it states that they will serve their God and David their king. Well, we all know that David had long passed by the time Jeremiah wrote this. He 
passed probably 400 years prior to Jeremiah even writing. David passed away in like 970 BC. So this is some 400 years um, after David died. Died. So Jeremiah is writing about David, their king, during this millennium period, during the time of Jacob's trouble. Well, commentators and Bible scholars have a couple of schools of thought on this topic, so let me present both of them to you. Number one, most commentators believe, which I'm in this camp here, <clears throat> believe that the name of Jesus here, uh, David, that's mentioned, is referring to Messiah or as we know him as Jesus Christ. Uh, in, in other words, Jesus, right, he will rule in the line of David, the son of Jesse. There are many passages that state that Messiah will come from the tribe of Judah and specifically the line of David. Let me give you some supporting scriptures. Isaiah 11, chapter 1. The Bible says, uh, uh, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 5 and 6. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth, even in the New Testament. Jesus is referred to as the son of David. Matthew 1 and 1, the very first sentence in your New Testament reads, the book of genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So this verse that Jeremiah writes could easily be understood that he is referring not to David necessarily, but a David type, a Messiah, or as we know him, Jesus Christ. Secondly, this is the second school of thought, that it actually means David, right? Because David himself will be resurrected, just as all the other people that have died uh, in, in faith, we will all be resurrected at that time. So the other school of thought is the resurrected David himself will rule and reign Israel during the millennial reign because the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, we will all reign with him. We will all reign with Jesus Christ. David's going to reign. Solomon's going to reign. Paul and Peter and John, everybody in the kingdom of God now or have passed along the way are going to rule and reign with Jesus Christ. So even if David is the king of Israel. During the millennial reign, Jesus Christ will be the king of kings. Make no mistake about that. We are not worshiping David. We will worship Yeshua, Hamashiach, Jesus Christ, although David may be over the nation of Israel. So either way, either way, we, um, servants of God, we will reign with Jesus Christ over that time. We will uh, rule and reign over territories, whether they're nations, cities, counties, villages, whatever we're appointed to that time in the millennial reign. Because re remember this, the millennial reign, we're not in heaven. We are on earth for 1,000 years. For 1,000 years. It won't be a new earth. It won't be a, uh, a new heaven yet. It won't be a new Jerusalem because that doesn't happen till later in Revelation. But we are going to rule and reign for 1,000 years as Jesus Christ sets up his government on this earth in Jerusalem. So let me give you some supporting scriptures that we will rule, reign, and not only that, we will judge with Jesus Christ. Beginning in Revelation chapter 2, beginning in Revelation chapter 2, verses 26 and 27, we will rule with Jesus Christ. Here's what the passage says. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. That one will rule with them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery, just as as I, this is Jesus speaking, have received authority from my Father. We will also reign with Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy chapter 2, beginning in verse 11. 
The Bible states, here is a trustworthy saying, if we died with him, we will also live with him. Verse 12, if we endure, we will also reign with him. Here's another scripture concerning reigning with Christ. Revelation chapter 20, verse 6. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priest of God. That's a key phrase. Priest, priest of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. Year. So this is the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, and we will reign with him for that thousand years here on earth. Now, it says that we shall be priest of God. The purpose of a priest was to bring the cause of the people before God. That was the, the prophet spoke to the people on behalf of God. The priest went to God on behalf of the people. So while we are reigning on earth for that thousand years, we will go to God. We will go to Messiah on behalf of the peace, uh, uh, behalf of the people. So during the millennial reign, we will serve. I don't know as presidents, governors, mayors. I don't know, dog catcher, I don't know. We will have some kind of rule and reign on this earth according to the scripture of God. So whatever it is, we will bring the cause of the people before the king of kings. Now we're also going to judge. Let's look at the scripture. It's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. And here's what the Bible says. Or do you not know that the Lord's people will judge the world? And if you are to judge the world, are you not com competent to judge trivial cases? So there it is. We are going to judge the world. We're going to judge the angels, the Bible says as well. You know, so Paul's saying, hey, if we're going to judge those things, can't you even like settle these little matters on earth between yourself? You know, in other words, you don't need Judge Judy, if you know what I'm talking about. Just settle the matters yourself. But now listen, let's keep our focus because this is a study of eschatology. We're looking at end times. These passages, all, every passage that I just read is all speaking about the dispensation of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. So while we're here, let me drop this thought to you. When we enter into the millennial reign with Jesus Christ, we will not just be sitting around, right, eating Doritos, eating bonbons, you know, watching reruns of Law and Order or Sanford or Son, or, uh, you know, we're not going to be playing Fortnite or, you know, watching those crazy cat YouTube videos, you know. We, we will have purpose. We will have responsibilities. The millennial reign is not our retirement program. We won't be sitting around on a cloud, you know, just passing the time away, playing our harp or something. We will have duties. We will have responsibilities. The amount of responsibility that we're trusted with then is based on how faithful we are now with whatever talents and treasures that we've been allotted by the king of kings there are three parables in the gospel of matthew chapter 25 remember everything in context because if you leave out some of the text there's a chance you're going to get stuck with a con so matthew chapter 25 comes right after matthew 24 what happens in matthew 24 it's the olivet discourse jesus is speaking about the end of the age when he goes into matthew 25 he speaks of three parables all pertaining to the end times. The first one he speaks about is the ten virgins. Five foolish, five wise. Five get left behind, five go in the rapture. It's speaking about the rapture. That's the whole purpose of the parable of the ten virgins. The parable of the sheep and the goats. When you read it's a separation, it's clearly speaking about judgment. When does judgment happen? in the end times. So you have the uh, parable of the ten virgins, speaking of the rapture, the sheep and the goats, speaking about the judgment. The third parable in Matthew 25 is the parable of the talents. The parable of the talents is Jesus is speaking about our faithfulness. He's speaking about our obedience 
to what he's given us and he speaks about our coming rewards. So my word to you, my friend, my brother, my sister, is all of us have been giving talents, we've been given treasure, we've been given gifts and skill sets. It's up to us to invest those in to the kingdom of God. So I want to encourage you to get busy with whatever God has entrusted to you. Do not half step with the things of God. Ask yourself at the end of every day, how did I contribute to the kingdom of God today? What did I accomplish for God's kingdom today? What, you know, was I about my father's business or was it all about me today? Was it about, was I about my father's business? Did I call somebody, see how they were doing? Did I send somebody a, a text to encourage them maybe? Did I you know, pray with somebody? Now listen, listen, I am not talking about Facebook. You know, when somebody says, hey, can you pray for me? And you know, you send those little, uh, those praying hands, those little emojis. Listen, <laughs> I gotta tell you, it's a sad, sad day when our prayer life is reduced to sending somebody a little emoji. That's a sad, sad day. But pray with somebody, call somebody, spend some time praying for the people who are in need of prayer today. Share the gospel with somebody, even if you're sitting down shooting Facebook messages out or Instagram or Twitter or whatever multi uh, or social media that you're using. Call somebody, share the gospel of Jesus Christ, advance the kingdom of God. So whatever asset you have, whatever talent or treasure that you have, are you using it every day for God's kingdom? Remember, <clears throat> the words that we want to hear when we face Jesus Christ is well done, my good and faithful servant. We do not want to hear woe to you. Depart from me, ye er, worker of iniquity. We want to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. You know, when we show up before Jesus Christ, we are not going to be give, given a Bible quiz. You won't be asked, well, how many books were in the Bible? Can you name them in order? Can you name the you know, 12 tribes of Israel? Can you name the 12 uh, apostles? There's not going to be a pop quiz. He's not going to judge us on what our, what we know. Now, Bible study is good. It's essential. <clears throat> it builds our faith that we might. That, that's why the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, the apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, evangelist, they are gifts given to the body to prepare the body for works of service. This knowledge is so that you can be involved in works of service to do something. So once again, we're not going to be judged on what we know or what we don't know. What is going to be judged are our works. Have we been faithful to what God has entrusted us? Now, Jesus says, you know, this faithful servant, well done, my good and faithful servant, not my good and faithful pastor, my good and faithful bishop, my good and faithful prophet my good and faithful servant. We are all servants of God in his kingdom. Amen. So, in summary, the time of Jacob's trouble is the seven-year tribulation period prophesied by Jeremiah at the end of the age that has been predestined for the salvation of the Jewish nation. Now, next week, we will get into Daniel's 70th week, which is absolutely fascinating. The prophecies that Daniel uh, wrote and that God gave him are just, I mean, the, they're astounding, the accuracy of them. So we're going to begin to jump into Daniel's 70th week next week. You don't want to miss this next study. Now, just in case you stumbled into this Bible study online somehow, maybe a friend sent it to you, and you're like, well, what is all this about, all this end time stuff? And I don't know, this COVID-19 is really seems to change a lot of things, and it really has raised a lot of questions, and rightfully so, rightfully so, you know. Um, but I don't even know Jesus. Who is Jesus? Or 
Maybe you're a Christian, but you lost your first love. You've grown cold. You lost that fire in your heart for the things of God. Maybe he's blessed you with gifts and talents. Maybe he's blessed you with treasure and you've just been sitting on these things. You're not investing them in to the kingdom of God. You know, it's, it's almost like you're waiting for it. Listen, now is the time. Now is the time to get invested into the kingdom of God. And if you don't know Jesus at this point, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to call on the name of the Lord. Would you pray with me? It's just a simple prayer. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, it says, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So would you pray with me? Simply say, Lord, in the name of Jesus, I come before you today. I ask you to forgive me for all my sins, for everything I've ever committed. I'm sorry for my sins. Today I believe that God raised Jesus Christ from the dead and I confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. I ask you to come into my life in the name of Jesus. Lord, I'm saved, but I've been sitting here a long time with things and giftings and talents that you've invested into me. But I want to pour them out like never before. Even as Paul said, I want to be poured out like a drink offering. That when I show up at your feet, there is nothing left of me. But I've poured everything out into your service here on this earth. Forgive me for sitting around. Forgive me for my laziness, my lethargy, Lord God. Forgive me. I want to be fully, wholly invested into your kingdom in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. My friend, my brother, my sister, if you prayed that prayer, listen, God heard your prayer and he forgave you. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We serve a good mighty God. If you prayed the prayer of salvation, the Bible says that you're saved, that you're born again, that you're filled with the Spirit, that your name is now written in the Lamb's book of life. Now, we'd love to hear from you. If you have any comments or, once again, if you have a question concerning the Bible study, uh, if you'd like to receive the study guides, uh, you could simply email us at gobeyond at judahministries.net. That's gobeyond at judahministries.net. Now, if you prayed that salvation prayer for the very, very first time, there's a couple of things that you really need to do to enhance your growth in your newfound Christian faith. Number one, you need to pray. Pray is basically speaking with God. Have a conversation. Let him know of your uh, your con concerns or your desires. Be open and frank with God. The Bible says that we can boldly go before his throne of grace now. Number two, you need to begin to read the word. I suggest, I recommend that you begin at the Gospel of John. If you don't have a Bible, you could simply load one down on your computer or on your electronic device, on your phone. They're free apps. Just go in there and search the Gospel of John and begin to read. And number three, you need to become a part of a fellowship. It's very, very important. The Bible talks about this all the time. It says, forsake not the gathering of the saints of God. Even more as you see the day approaching. So we need to be a part of a good, solid Bible preaching church. Uh, now, if you're in the greater Pittsburgh area, we'd love to meet you. We'd love to fellowship with you. Love to have you come and worship with us at the Judah Ministries International Worship Center. It's located at 525 Market Street, McKeesport, Pennsylvania, 15132. That's 525 Market Street, McKeesport, Pennsylvania, 15132. We are a cross-cultural 
non-denominational congregation. So if you come in your Sunday best or your favorite pair of blue jeans, you will not feel out of place at the Judah Ministries International Worship Center. Our services begin at 10.30 a.m. And once again, the address is 525 Market Street, McKeesport, Pennsylvania, where there is always <laughs> extravagant praise, intimate worship, and the unadulterated preaching of God's holy word. We hope to see you there. And if not, we hope to see you right here next time as together we go beyond. God bless you. to proclaim.